Farrell TV. Farrell TV, the voice for humanity. Hi, welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. I am your noble host, recently shaved host, Dustin Pickering. Today we have John Guzlowski. His writing appears in Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac, North American Review, Rattle, Ontario Review, Salon.com, and many other journals. And his personal essays and poems about his Polish parents' experiences as slave laborers in Nazi Germany and refugees making a life for themselves in Chicago appear in his award-winning memoir, Echoes of Tattered Tongues, published by Aquila Polonica Press. He is also a columnist for the Dejenic Zawatkawi, the oldest Polish language daily in America. I hope I got that pretty close to correct. And the author of Suitcase Charlie and Little Altar Boy, nor mystery novels set in Chicago. How are you doing today, John? It's nice to see you. Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on, Dustin. Absolutely. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can learn about poetry and, and art from you. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some interesting insights. We usually come up with some nice things. So um, so tell us uh, about uh, how did you acquire the stories that you um, wrote in and then Echoes for Tattered Tongues? Were those passed down to you or did you have documents or? It was it was interesting. Uh, I the book Echoes of Tattered Tongues is about uh, uh, pretty much about my parents' experiences as uh, slave laborers. Both of them were, uh, uh, they were Polish teenagers in Poland uh, at the time when the Second World War started. And uh, uh, my father was taken to um, Germany as a slave laborer in 1940 and then spent four years in Buchenwald concentration camp. And my mother was uh, captured in 42 by the Germans, uh, she was she was living in, in Eastern Poland, so it took the Germans a little while to get there. And she was captured in 42 and uh, taken, taken to Germany and she spent the next three years there. And the two of them, uh, you know, the war ended in 45, but uh, both of them uh, didn't go back to Poland after the war. They were afraid to go back. Uh, her, uh, my mother's uh, brother went back after spending years in a concentration camp in uh, in Germany, and he went back, and uh, what happened to him was that the uh, the Russians were there waiting for him, and so when he got off the train in uh, in Poland in his hometown, uh, the Russians grabbed him and sent him to another concentration camp in in uh, in Russia, uh, in Siberia, uh, hmm. where he spent the rest of his life uh, in a concentration camp in Siberia. So my parents were afraid to go back. And uh, these, the stories about my parents, uh, you know, my father was incapable of, uh, of, of holding stories back. And so that he would, uh, from the time I was about five or six years old, he would be telling me stories about his experiences in the camps. I remember being about six years old and my father telling me about how one day he was watching these German soldiers and they attacked the woman and they uh, cut off her breasts with the bayonet. Mm. And uh, I was six years old listening to these stories. And you know, I realize now that all of these stories were inappropriate. You know, he shouldn't have been sharing them with me. But uh, you know, my father uh, you know, had probably some kind of post-stress uh, uh, disorder, mm. and, um, couldn't control himself. And so I, I heard these stories you know, from the time I was a kid. and. And you know, my father passed these stories down to me, and uh, it was interesting. My mother, my mother would never tell me stories, uh, not for a long, 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 long time, about what happened to her. Uh, when I asked, when I would ask her, you know, to tell me something about her experiences in the war, my mother would say, uh, "I'm just going to tell you two things. If they give you bread, eat it. If they if they beat you, you should run away." And that, that's all she would say for years. It wasn't until I was in my late 50s that my mother started telling me about uh, her experiences in the camp. I think, I think that at that point, she, she realized that, that I was mature enough and, uh, to listen to these stories from her. And uh, 
and, and do something with these stories. Interesting. So they were they're basically um, told to you. Yeah. Did you find the, the the writing of the book to be, you know, did it disturb you to write the book and try it to, was, how did you cope with that? I mean, that's, that's it, what, you know, the writing the book, I, I started writing the book uh, in 1979. Uh, I had, I had no intention of writing a book about my parents. I was trying to stay away from even thinking about what it was my parents had gone through. Uh, my mother used to call what happened to her in the concentration camps, camp shit. And she, she was trying to avoid thinking about that camp shit. And uh, I felt the same way. I mean, I just wanted to, I wanted to get away from them. I wanted to get away from these stories that my father was telling me. And uh, I, you know, I, I went, I went to graduate school and I was in graduate school studying American literature, not thinking at all about my parents. I mean, I hadn't, I would see my parents about once a year. And uh, one, one afternoon I sat, I was sitting there uh, getting ready to do a test or something. And I, I was, I started thinking about my parents and uh, about what, what they were thinking about. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a poem about it. And I hadn't written a poem, you know, probably in about seven years, I hadn't written a poem at that, at that point, but I wrote a poem about what they were thinking. And you know, a couple of months later, I wrote another poem and another poem and another poem. And uh, you know, eventually, I, you know, I had this book of poems about my parents and about their experience. And they, you know, they came just, they just came very gradually. Mm -hmm. you know, I never intended to, uh, to write a book about them, but, uh, you know, this, the book just sort of happened. Uh, wow. Yeah. And sometimes, it, you know, poetry puts a demand on you and, and just, you know, there's no controlling it sometimes it just seems to kind of weasel its way into making you do certain things yeah. and you know there's a compulsion there it sounds like you know what you experience is sort of wanting to let go of a lot of this stuff and and move forward and then your your consciousness was just kind of creating a scenario you know where you had to write these poems to did you find it at all healing or did, did it sort of still haunt you you know the, 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 I, you know, healing, I, you know, I just, I don't know if it's healing, you know, the reason what I discovered writing these poems was that uh, the poems brought me closer to my parents. You know, I, I had, I had wanted to get away from my parents. I wanted to get away from their stories. And then as I got older and, and realized, I guess I realized, I realized how, how important these stories were to my parents. I wanted to share the stories with them. I wanted to hear more of the stories. And, you know, I it got to the point where I, I was consciously, every time I would see them, I would encourage them to talk to me about what had happened to them. Uh, you know, th and this was like, this is like 17, 18 years after I started doing this thing. You know, I got to a point where I just wanted to hear more of these stories. Uh, hmm. and then my dad died and I wasn't, you know, he died in, in 97, 1997, and there were no more stories from him. And uh, that's when my, that's when I started putting, I guess, more pressure on my mother to tell me these stories and, and that she did. But, you know, in, in hearing her tell these stories, it brought my father closer to me. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, my mother is gone now. Mm -hmm. She died in 2006, and and when I read, when I when I when I write about my parents, when I do poetry readings about uh, my parents, when I talk to when I talk to you uh, about my about my parents, it just brings them closer to me, and it's like I'm it's like I'm sitting there again with them. Uh, mm. The poems, the poems that are I guess the most important to me uh, that I've written are the poems poems where I've I've actually used words that my my parents spoke, um, mm. and because then you know when I when I read those poems again or when I when I read those poems at a at a at a reading you know it's like my parents are uh, telling me these stories again and uh, it's you know it's very important to me to to be with them like that. Right, so have, they're sort of present within the poetry and the language their, their language is in, is embedded into it I, I wonder if that's there's some sort of genetic thing going there or if maybe just hearing the words 
flowing in and you, they flowed back out the same way or they came out the way that they flowed in or yeah i you know i when like there's this poem and it's the first poem in the echoes book and it's a mm -hmm. poem where my mother is telling me yeah, let me tell you how I wrote the poem. Uh, I wrote the poem because I, I had written a poem where my father told me about how he, he and my mother were captured and taken to Germany. And uh, I, I read that poem to my mother at some point, And my mother said to me, that's not the way it was at all. And mm -hmm. she, started, she started telling me the story about how she was captured. And so the, the poem Boy, you know that poem is really important to me because it's it's a it's pretty much entirely in my mother's <laughs> my mother's language, mm -hmm. and uh, for me, what's you know what what's important in that poem is that it's that I can hear her, I can hear all of the nuances of what she's saying, and all of the you know the sort of the reasons why she's saying some saying what's ex what she's saying. And it just like, you know, for me, it just physically brings her back to me. And uh, I, you know, I love, I love reading that poem out loud because I, you know, I hear my mother, I hear my mother in that poem. Wow. That's interesting. So that's literally like echoes of tattered tongues. I mean, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that title, you know, but still speaks to that. Yeah. 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 That, 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 uh, you know, my, it, it the tattered tongues are my parents' tattered tongues, and mm. uh, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing what I'm hearing are just uh, these echoes of uh, of their speaking, and uh, you know, you know, to me to me that's really important. Yeah. I'm curious. You've written reviews and um, all kinds of different other th you know things uh, as well as poetry, and and of course you have the memoirs and everything you know you've written. What what led you to, to be so prolific? Is there a sort of a secret, or is there just like a internal clockwork pushing you, or comic books? <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, I remember the first comic book I ever saw. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my both my parents. My father was was illiterate, and uh, uh, my mother read some, but you know there were never any books around the house, and. Uh, when I was like, I think I was like five years old and I was visiting a friend's house and I was in the bathroom pooping and uh, next to the bath, uh, next to the toilet, they had a whole stack of comic books. Mm -hmm. And I picked up one of the comic books and I couldn't read. I didn't know a thing about words, but what was mm -hmm. happening in this comic book, I couldn't put the comic book down. Interesting. <laughs> There was something about the words or, you know, the words that I didn't understand or the visuals. I couldn't put this thing down. Finally, somebody came to the bathroom and started knocking on the door, wondering what had happened to me. <laughs> I had been in the bathroom for like 45 minutes. I mean, I can still remember that comic book. And mm. uh, I can remember the comic book. It's, it was a, uh, it was, what, it was a, the company was Atlas. And uh, it was mm -hmm. an comic and it was, uh, a zombie coming out of a grave, and uh, you know, hmm. this just it was just the greatest thing I had at that point had ever. Uh, <laughs> I guess the the presentation, the artistic merits oh, yeah. of the book were more yeah. interesting than the words themselves. And yeah, yeah, I didn't know what the words were, but it was it was a book, and it was a book with pictures, and it was hmm. a book that was telling some kind of story, and you uh, it got. It's the thing that got me interested in in all kinds of uh, all kinds of writing, and uh, I, you know, I I I read that comic book that I did. I looked at that comic book. I I studied that comic book that day, and I spent the next uh, you know fifteen years, twenty years, reading comic books. And then from comic books, I went. To, I read science fiction. I read mm -hmm. uh, just about. Every, I read. Uh, Dostoevsky, I read Kerouac, I, I read Shakespeare, I'm reading everything, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in comic books, because I just loved, loved words, and uh, mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole experience of words and storytelling, and I think that uh, what attracts me to all kinds of writing, and I, and like you say, I, I do all kinds of writing, is the storytelling, mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, conveying, conveying some kind mm -hmm. of narrative, some kind of story. 
And I like to play with concepts, use language to play with concepts. And that's kind of what storytelling too is, you know, putting these concepts together like a jigsaw puzzle and seeing where it goes. You know, you know I, I, I write reviews too. And so when I write a review, a lot of times I just sort of pick, pick things that stand out in the book. And yeah. then I talk about those and I try to weave them together and make sense of it. And it's sort of a very, it's a very creative process. I don't know if people understand book reviews or how that works, you know, but that's, that's how I, that's how I work when I do it. I, you know? yeah, I feel the same way about reviews, you know, for me, a review <laughs> is, is, you know, it, there's gotta be some kind of personal connection that I'm making with the book right. I'm doing and, and then the thing I'm writing. Uh, and a lot for me, this this works a lot of times. But for some editors, uh, it won't work. I, I wrote a review of a of a, a history of uh, the Second World War, and there was too much personal narrative in the review, and the uh, the editor didn't like it. But yeah, you know, hmm. it didn't matter to me. What was important was that that personal narrative that uh, right. I, was, I was discovering in the book. Right, that's interesting. Uh you know, I, I think that I guess it edit, some editors are not. You know, they want to. They want to remove. You know, they want a sort of objective look. Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, or and they want it under three hundred words. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Or yeah, more than, than, than three hundred words. Yeah, or three hundred to six hundred words or something. You know, it's like they, yeah. they ask you for like a really succinct. You know, look at the book. And it's, it can be kind of tough sometimes. Yeah. So. What about uh, language of mules? What what is the idea behind that? What is the you know, that's such an interesting title? Yeah, that was it. Was the the book language of mules was the uh, was the, the the first? It was a chapbook that I put together about my parents. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, back you know back a long time ago, back about twenty five years ago, and. Uh, the language of mules. Uh, the title comes from uh, you know, my father gave me the, the title uh, when he was talking about the way that the the German guards would uh, would treat him and the other prisoners. Uh, you know, he my father would say that the Germans treated treated the prisoners like they were mules, uh, hmm. speaking the language of mules, and mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's where that title came came from. Uh, you know, it's. And so that, you know, the German soldiers felt, the guards felt that my father spoke the language of mules. And, uh, you know, what I was trying to do uh, in that book was capture the, capture the language of mules and, uh, mm. and show that, uh, um, you know, my father, my father wasn't a mule. Uh, right. That the language that some people thought was, you know, mulish was in fact, you know, was not mule, mulish at all. Yeah, that's part of that dehumanization of the enemy kind of oh, goes on in war. You know, they look down, they, they really want to make you look like the, the bottom of the barrel gross yeah. and, and dehumanize you and that yeah. it's easier to torture people when you have no that's understanding true. of them, you know, when you erase their completely erase their identity, yeah. they're no longer people, they're just yeah. objects. Yeah, and, uh, you know, for, for the Germans, the Germans, uh, uh, you know, were treating... Uh, Treating people who weren't Germans as subhuman, uh, uh, you know, the term undermensch, uh, subhuman. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's that's where that language of mules title came from. Uh, you know, it you know, it was like mm. it's like guards didn't even think my my father could make any kind of sense when he spoke because he spoke the language of mules. Right, <laughs> it's an interesting title, and I'm fascinated to hear the story behind that. You know, it's uh, I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm actually curious to read it now. And take a look at it. So, if you you know want to share some poetry with us, uh, we okay. feel free to read a couple of poems for us. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to read some poems. Uh, you know, like I said, the language of mules was like the first version mm -hmm. uh, of of my poems about my parents, and uh, the most recent version is uh, is the uh, echoes of tattered tongues. And so, I'm going to I'm going to read some poems from that. Okay, and uh, I'm going to read uh, the first poem. I'm going to read is about uh, uh, my mother and uh, what the what the experience is, uh, how the war affected her. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, the poem's called What the War Taught Her. Okay. And let's see, I got it right here. Okay. Watching the New York Parrot. 
Yeah, John Guzowski here. He's going to read us a poem. Yeah, the uh, poem's called What the War Taught Her. My mother learned that sex is bad. Men are worthless. It is always cold and there is never enough to eat. She learned that it, she learned that if you are stupid with your hands, you will not survive the winter, even if you survive the fall. She learned that only young people survive the camps. The old ones are left in piles like worthless paper and babies are scarce like chickens and bread. She learned that the world is a broken place where no birds sing and even angels cannot bear the sorrows God gives them. My mother learned that you don't pray your enemies will not torment you. You only pray that they will not kill you. Yeah, she, was, you know, she was captured in 1942 and uh, spent the next two and a half, three years in, uh, in slave labor camps. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, she was, she was, she she arrived in Germany at the end of uh, at the end of uh, forty two in November, and uh, taken directly to a uh, to a farm where she and the other girls from uh, from her village were sent out to dig up beets, and uh, the girls were were wearing uh, what they had been wearing when. Uh, when the Germans captured them, some of them had coats and some of them didn't have coats. And uh, some of them had shoes, some of them didn't. And they were forced to go out and dig up these beets uh, with, without any tools, without any shovels. They were just sent out into the fields to dig, out, to dig up the beets. Uh, can I read a poem about that? Yes, please do. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, poem. it's a poem called The Beets. Mm -hmm. And my mother, my mother would, uh, when she finally started telling me stories, she would she would oftentimes talk about uh, that that first uh, that first winter in uh, in Germany and uh, digging up beets. Mm -hmm. My mother tells me about the beets she dug up in Germany. They were endless, redder than roses gone bad in an early frost, redder than a grown man's kidney or heart. The first beat she remembers, she was alone in the field, alone without her mother or father near, no sister even. They were all dead, left behind in Poland. The ground was wet and cold, but not soft. It was never soft. She ate the raw beet, even though she knew they would beat her. She says, sometimes she pretended she was deaf, stupid, crippled, or diseased with typhus or cholera even with what the children called the French disease, anything to avoid the slap, the whip across her back, the leather fist in her face above her eye. If my mother could have given them her breasts to suck, her womb to penetrate, she would have, just so they would not hurt her the way they hurt her sister and her mother and the baby. My mother wonders, what was her reward? for living in such a world. It was not love or money. She can't remember what happened to the money the American sergeant left the day in the spring when the war ended. She wonders if God will remember her labors. She wonders if there is a God. Uh, the, uh, the war really, you know, it really, it really shook, her, shook her up. It shook her faith in, in, in religion. It shook her faith in God. Uh, yeah. When she was dying, when my mother was dying, I asked her, she was 83 when she died, and I asked her if she wanted me to, to have a priest come. She was a Catholic. I asked her if she wanted to have a, a priest come and give her uh, the last rites. And my mother said, uh, she said she didn't want to see the priest. She said no priest had ever come back from heaven to tell us what is actually there. Hmm. And she just wouldn't have anything to do with any of that. Um, wow. Interesting. That's that's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't blame her at all. It's that's a very rough experience, and and, and you know, to be treated as like such a, you know, an object to people, and, oh, and totally without any, you know, any, did they have any kind of warning that this was going to happen, or did it just get no, on well, them? It 
you know, the, the, what the Germans were doing was they were trying to, to move people out of Poland uh, the, mm -hmm. the people who were living there because they wanted to move German people into the country. They wanted to colonize the uh, right. Poland. And so my father was, you know, it was really early in the war. It was, it was like six months after the war started. It was early in 1940 that the Germans came to his village and just gathered people up. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, the same thing with my mother. Yeah, she, she never thought that, the, uh, that, that this kind of stuff would happen. But so many people, I, you know, I, I've seen statistics and I, it's about one out of six Poles was taken to Germany uh, and uh, either taken to Germany or taken to Russia by the uh, by the Russians uh, during the war. They were just trying to you know clear that whole country out. Mm. Wow! You can share another poem if you like. Okay, yeah, a, a poem about my dad. Okay, it's called uh, "What My Father Ate." <laughs> my father, when my father was. Uh, uh, my father spent four years in the camps, and when he was finally liberated in 1945, he weighed 70, 75 pounds. And, uh, you know, my granddaughter weighs about 80 pounds right now, and, uh, and I can pick her up and, uh, and you know, move her and you know, pick her up and uh, swirl her around and stuff like that. And... Um, you know, and I, it's amazing to, for me to think of my father as weighing 75 pounds. And uh, I asked him how he was able to survive because you know, I've read about what life was like in the, uh, in the camp he was in. And they got about 600 calories of food a day. And uh, a lot of it was inedible. Uh, one, one time my father complained about the food that uh, they were being given and uh, the guard hit him in the hit him in the head with a club. And my father stood back up and said, you know, you, you can club me, but I'm still gonna say, I want, I need food, I want food. And the guard clubbed him again and again until uh, my father was unconscious. And when my final, father finally got, came back to consciousness, he was blinded his, uh, in one eye, uh, was never able to have sight in that, that eye again. But uh, I asked my father how he was able to survive. And uh, he told me, about what he had to eat to survive uh, in the camp. Um, let me get the, let me find that poem. The poem's called What My Father Ate. And this is the New York Parrot Literary Corner. We're talking to John Gazowski. Yeah. Oops, sorry. So we got about 10 minutes left in the programming. I can, I'll read as fast as I can. <laughs> Take your time, it'll be good. <laughs> uh, what My Father Ate. My father ate what he couldn't eat, what his mother taught him not to. Brown grass, small chips of wood, the dirt beneath his gray dark fingernails. He ate the leaves off trees. He ate bark. He ate the mules that tormented the mules working in the fields. He ate what would kill a man in the normal course of his life, leather buttons, cloth caps, anything small enough to get into his mouth. He ate roots, he ate newspaper. In his slow, clumsy hunger, my dad did what the birds did, picked for oats or corn or any kind of seed left in the dry shit by the cows. And when there was nothing to eat, he would search the ground for pebbles and they would, they would loosen his saliva and he would swallow that. And the other men did the same. Right. Excuse me. I got a phone call. But all right. That's, uh, it's very powerful to think and to, to bring that image into, you know, into poetry. And it's uh, that, that experience is like it's, it's beyond you know, anything that most of us could oh, ever, yeah. Yeah. most anybody could really. I and mean, there's just a human need to eat. I mean, even if you're just eating, it sounds like, you know, he ha had that urge to eat and then there was just nothing to really to there eat. Was, yeah, there was, there was nothing to eat. And uh, it, was, it was funny, uh, when af after the war, uh, I, I remember, you know, I remember 
getting together with my father and he would, he would cook breakfast on Saturday mornings and he would make these enormous breakfasts. And, uh, you know, I, I never, I never thought about when I was a kid, I never thought about why we'd be eating all of this. You know, he would have, he would make a breakfast where he would take a uh, two pounds of Polish sausage and cut it up. And then he would take a uh, you know, dozen eggs and fry them up with the Polish sausage. And he'd have a uh, half a loaf of bread and we would all eat this stuff. And it was just, you know, it was like, it was like he couldn't, he couldn't forget the hunger that he was, he experienced during the war. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely horrific to imagine that doing that to, you know, people doing that to each other, you know, torturing each other in that way. So I think we have a little bit of time to talk about, uh, I believe you have a, an upcoming title from Finishing Line Press, or if yeah. you, have, you have a couple of titles from them, if you want to just give a little plug for that. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I've got a, a book coming out. Uh, well, it's out, it just came out. It's called The Mad Monk Ikkyu, and it's about a... Uh, 16th century Japanese Zen Buddhist monk, uh, Ikkyu, who was referred to as the mad monk because he had a very, a very, very strange sense of humor. And uh, I, I don't even, I was trying to remember this morning about how I got in, interested in uh, writing about Ikkyu. And I can't remember how I, I got in, interested in it, but mm. it's a book of poems about uh, uh, Ikkyu uh, starting out at the ocean and walking to a temple up mm -hmm. in the mountains of Japan. And it's about, uh, you know, about the things he sees and as he walks along, uh, along the path going up to the mountain. Uh, be happy to, happy to read a couple of the poems. I think we have time for maybe one. We have about, uh, about five minutes. Yikes. Okay. Oh, let me see if I've got it here. Yeah. Uh, this is a, Poem. The, the cover of the book is uh, is of uh, a hand with a palm with a tree growing in it. It's a palm of a hand with a tree growing in it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, it's it's by a uh, it, it was painted by a a, a British artist and uh, a friend of mine. And uh, I'm going to read the poem that inspired him to write write to draw that picture, draw that painting. Okay. Uh, and it's here it is. Ikkyu sits in the marketplace and tries to explain everything. Here's what he says to a soldier. He says, a tree is the palm of my hand and the face of all there is in the universe to wonder about. It is the tree to heaven and its roots start in my heart and yours. That's it. Oh. Wow, that's 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 beautiful. It's quite a quite a contrast to some of the the other stuff. You know, it's it's definitely yeah. something fresh. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting. Uh, doing the book was interesting because uh, you know so much of my poetry is about uh, about war mm. and you know, the disaster of war and the chaos and brutality of war. And this is a this is a book that that's that's not about that. It's about uh, you know sitting in the shadows and dreaming about uh, about different sorts of things yeah i think we have a, a little bit of time if you want to impart some you know words of advice to fellow writers or say well, thank you to anybody out there well i want to thank you and thank you uh, as well i want, I want to thank everybody who's ever read anything uh, mm -hmm. uh by me uh because it's you know I, I love writing, and uh, when I when I hear that people re read some of my things, I'm uh, I'm always happy to, to uh, I'm always made happy by that. Uh, my my advice to writers, uh, uh, my advice to writers is to write, and uh, you know, I, for me, the most important thing is when I get an idea, I got to sit down and I've got to write that idea, mm -hmm. and. Uh, if I don't, if I don't sit down immediately and write whatever it is that uh, that I'm I'm feeling I should be writing, it always gets lost. And so my my advice to writers is always just you know if if an idea comes to you, sit down immediately. Don't don't say you know I'll write about it later. Just write about it immediately. And yeah, it goes back to the either you know it comes down to you and it visits for men. If you don't yeah, entertain yeah, yeah. it, it goes right back where it came from. Maybe somebody oh, else. Yeah. Will 
Absolutely. The muse, the muse comes and the muse tells you something. You better listen to that muse because she's not going to be around for a long time. Right. <laughs> so thank you, John, for joining us. And your stories you. are, are wonderful. It's, it, it makes you really appreciate what we have here, especially in the United States and then you know, in the stable environment that we live in. It's, it, you know, it's very harrowing to hear these, these stories of war. And but I think we need to be you know, open to that definitely to hearing things of, you know, these, of this nature to kind of give us some perspective on things. So thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And this has been the New York Parrot Literary Corner. And I'm Justin Bickering. We had John Guzlowski today. And if anybody out there would like to donate, uh, we have paypal.me slash nyparrot. The link will be at our YouTube. And we were looking for 1 million subscribers. So please subscribe, hit that subscribe button on our YouTube and share our videos and our stuff and everything we, we put out there, our flyers, uh, just get it, get the word out for us. Thank you, we were really appreciative of our viewers. And uh, we're doing a, an anthology here in August of our guests and various people we've published. And hopefully that'll be an excellent uh, production and uh, looking forward to that. And I am Dustin Pickering, and this has been the New York Parrot Literary Corner. Thank you to our viewers, and thank you, John, again. And uh, everyone have a great day. Keep an eye out, subscribe, and don't forget, if you want to get in touch with us, New York Parrot, look for us. And it's at Literary Corner at NewYorkParrot.com. Literary Corner at NewYorkParrot.com. Get in touch with me, Dustin Pickering. Thank you very much again, everybody. Keep, look, keep a lookout for us. We'll be here again tomorrow.